Welcome everyone. Thanks for being here tonight. My name is Megan Wynn and I'm the Community Events Manager at the Peninsula Open Space Trust and I'll be your host for tonight. You're watching Scales and Tales, Reptiles and Amphibians of the Bay Area hosted by POST. Throughout our open spaces and urban areas, the Bay Area is home to many diverse reptiles and amphibians. From slippery serpents to lanky lizards, we will learn about creatures that crawl and slither their way through the bay. Personally, when I think about snakes, I get a little rattled. But tonight, I know we're in good hands with our expert speaker who will shed light on the elusive mysteries of the many slippery scales and tails that call our region home and what season they are most active. We'll also review how to be responsible wildlife watchers and learn proper techniques to handle our wild neighbors responsibly. This presentation will be interactive and we welcome your participation. You'll need to log into YouTube to ask your questions in the live chat. And we want all the questions, so keep them coming. For those of you who are new to post work, we are a nonprofit land trust and our mission is to protect open spaces on the peninsula and South Bay for the benefit of all. We are creating a network of protected lands where people and nature connect and thrive. Since 1977, POST has protected over 86,000 acres of land. When POST protects land, we are constantly thinking about how we can protect and enhance habitat for sensitive species. Climate change is a huge threat. And recently with the Bay Area's unusually warm weather in mid-October, climate change is affecting weather patterns. This impacts our scaled and tailed friends in many ways and amphibians specifically need a lot of moisture to survive and rely on rain patterns to signal when it is time to migrate to the breeding ponds and reproduce. But prolonged drought or wet years caused by climate change can scramble these signals. California newts are a species that is vulnerable to both climate change and wildlife connectivity. When we think about wildlife connectivity and road kills, larger animals like mountain lions and deer and large infrastructure like Highway 101 receives all the attention. However, it's important to remember that to our smaller creature friends, such as newts, local roads are a huge barrier to connectivity. For example, let's talk about the newts in the Santa Cruz Mountains, particularly near Highway 17. In order to get to their breeding site, they must first cross Alma Bridge Road, which is a 4.6 mile, two lane road along the east side of the Lexington Reservoir. It may not seem like a big deal to us, but when you move slightly faster than a snail, it's a life-threatening experience to cross the road. Citizen scientists were instrumental in raising the alarm about the danger newts face every year on this local road. And researchers estimated that about out of 14,000 adult California newts who attempted to cross the road during the survey period, almost 40% were killed by vehicles. Post is supporting our partners at the Mid Peninsula Open, uh, Regional Open Space District, also known as MidPen, who are working to build a series of new crossings over Alma Bridge to access the Lexington Reservoir and hopefully prevent thousands of newt deaths. Thanks to all the supporters and donors out there who help make our work possible. You can learn more about the work being done to protect newts by visiting the links in the chat. And as a bonus resource, We've done a lot of work to protect and improve habitat for the San Francisco garter snake along the San Mateo coast. You can read more about that in the links drop in the chat as well. And there are so many more scaled and tailed friends we will meet tonight with our speaker. So make sure you check those out and we'll also send this out in the, in the email and put it in the video description if you're watching um, this recording. Before we dive into the program tonight, I'd like to offer a land acknowledgement and invite you to share what native land you are currently occupying and tuning in from today in the chat. The land in post-working area includes the territories of the Amamutsun, Muwekma Ohlone, Ramatish Ohlone, and Tamiya Nation, as well as other native organizations and individuals who are descended from the first people of this land. These lands have been home to many native tribes since time immemorial and whose people are still here with us today. I want to also acknowledge the land itself, including the Santa Cruz Mountains, the Diablo Mountains, and the San Francisco Bay, as well as the Pacific Ocean, and the, all the watersheds and ecosystems that make up this landscape we call our home. So I see folks in the chat continuing to share where they're um, calling in from, so continue to keep those coming. Thank you for sharing. 
And uh, let this moment serve as a reminder that as residents of these places, no matter where we are, we have a responsibility to be caretakers of our shared home and neighbors, including wildlife. Without further ado, let me introduce you to our speaker tonight, who Brandon Kong is a graduate student in the Physiological Ecology of Reptiles Lab at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. His current work focuses on how drought, starvation, and dehydration affects reptiles. He completed his bachelor's degree in ecology and evolutionary biology at UC Santa Cruz, where he studied the genetic work on the Santa Cruz black salamander, and has also conducted numerous herpetological monitoring projects, such as the field, as a field technician for the Sanford Conservation Program and UC Natural Reserve System. Brandon is an avid field herper, spending as much time as possible seeking out amphibians and reptiles in the wild to better understand their natural history, and has so many great photos to share with us tonight. Without further ado, let's welcome Brandon to the stage. Hey, Brandon, good to see you. How are you doing? Hi, I'm doing all right. I'm happy to be here. Awesome. Well, thanks for being here. Um, before we dive into the content you'll be sharing with us, can you tell us a little bit about your story? We want to know what inspired you to become a biologist and work with reptiles and amphibians. Yeah, so I guess it all started when I was a little kid. I have a pretty uh, standard biologist, wildlife biologist background in terms of being obsessed with lizards and insects and things like that, that I found in the backyard as a little kid. And uh, that obsession, obsession just kind of stuck with me through childhood. I was definitely one of the uh, Steve Irwin and Jeff Corwin generation. Um, so that definitely kept <laughs> me interested in this sort of thing. And I just kept going to creeks and looking in the yard for all sorts of animals and that's still kind of what I do. <laughs> yeah, that's really cool. I definitely grew up watching Steve Irwin too, but was always too scared to touch snakes and reptiles um, up close, but I always appreciated looking um, from my screen. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what you'll talk about today? Yeah, so really the main thing that we'll be covering is the diversity of amphibians and reptiles that inhabit the Bay Area. And we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, what you should do to responsibly view them and their activity patterns throughout the year. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much. We can't wait. And as a reminder to our live audience, you'll need to log in to YouTube to participate in the chat and ask your questions. We'll ask them as we go. We'll also bring them up later during the Q&A session at the end. Um, and we'll also try to answer the many, many questions submitted by the viewers like you during the registration process. We might not get to all of them, but I promise we'll get to as many as we can. All right, that's enough for me. Brandon, take it away. Okay. I'm happy to be talking to all of you about the awesome animals that call the Bay Area home. And so let's jump right into it. I think it'd be great to start with these questions, what an amphibian is, what a reptile is, and what a herp is. So. We're gonna use this, phylog uh, this phylogenetic tree to think about these questions. This shows relationships between organisms. The points on the tree where two branches come together, like here, uh, represents a common ancestor. And you can see this one represents the common ancestor of marsupial mammals like kangaroos and placental mammals like us and dogs and most of the mammals we think of. As you go further back on the tree, that represents a more distant common ancestor. Here is where the amphibians are located on the tree. They make a nice natural group where all of the members of this group are each other's closest relatives. When you look at reptiles, you'll notice that birds are included in this part of the tree. And in fact, crocodilians are more closely related to birds than they are to lizards. So technically birds should be included with reptiles. However, um, herbs as a group, including amphibians and non-avian reptiles, uh, are not a natural group. They are not each other's closest relatives. If you look at the node right there, it shows where their last common ancestor was. It turns out that reptiles are more closely related to mammals than they are to amphibians, but we have lumped them together historically uh, due to them being uh, sort of similar in the ecologies that they have and the ways that we study them. So, now for some geographical context. We're talking about the Bay Area today, of course, and we are going to focus in on the South Bay in particular. 
where we'll be talking about the animals in the Santa Cruz Mountains. You can see how green they are from this satellite image. The Santa Cruz Mountains receive a lot of coastal influence in the form of fog and precipitation, and it makes it a much moister place than, for example, the Diablo Range to the east, which does not have as much of a coastal influence. Uh, resu sorry, <laughs> results in a lot of uh, drier habitats. Between these two small mountain ranges, we have the Santa Clara Valley, uh, which is largely developed nowadays, but it still has some pockets of habitats with interesting animals in them. Now we have a nice moisture gradient across the Bay Area, and that results in a lot of different types of habitats, ranging from heavily forested streams in the redwood forest to rugged chaparral habitats like in the bottom left to open grasslands in the top right image and lots of different things in between. Before we go into the animals that actually live there, I want to talk about biosecurity really quick. So there's this thing called chytrid fungus, which is a fungal pathogen that has decimated lots of amphibian populations all across the world. It's been spread around pretty much everywhere. Um, and then there are other pathogens such as the snake fungal disease, which are just starting to pop up in California. So it's really important that we are keeping these things in mind when we go out into wild places. So sanitizing your boots and your other gear is uh, crucial for stopping the spread of these sorts of pathogens. So you can use things like diluted bleach solutions and alcohol solutions to clean your boots and your other uh, equipment that you take outside with you before and after every outing. Um, making sure that the solution is in contact, whether or not you dunk your boots in it, like in this image, or if you use a spray bottle to cover it. Um, just make sure that solution is in contact with your stuff for about five minutes before you rinse it off with some water and go to your next destination. So now starting our tour through the seasons, we're gonna start with winter. And uh, to me in the Bay Area, winter generally correlates with the wet season, which usually runs from sometime in November to uh, and through February, um, although that varies quite a bit. And this is often called amphibian season because amphibians love uh, water and they're very dependent on being near it most of the time. So one of the major events that happens in the winter time is uh, breeding migrations. So fossorial species, that means species that spend most of their time underground, some of them only come up on rainy nights. So to get to habitats like this, they'll cross through grasslands and oak woodlands and things like that to reach these seasonal ponds these are really important breeding habitats for amphibians because they don't have aquatic predators like fish, which might eat their eggs and their larvae. Among these species are the Western Spadefoot Toad, which inhabits parts of the East Bay. We have the California Tiger Salamander, which is only found in California and is a threatened species. And the fairly closely related Santa Cruz Long Toad Salamander, which is an endangered salamander that only inhabits a handful of ponds south of, of the Santa Cruz area. So these guys are all at threat of uh, habitat alteration. Much of their habitats have been changed to agricultural use or uh, housing developments and things of that sort. So that's one of the main uh, threats towards these species here. Another migrating species, as we just learned about, are the Pacific newts. So you might have seen these two on trails if you have hiked during the wet season through the Santa Cruz Mountains or the Diablo Range. And uh, these guys, in contrast to most amphibians, which are typically nocturnal, are often active during the day, uh, partly emboldened by their highly toxic skin. These are among the most poisonous of vertebrates. And each little newt in some of the more toxic populations has enough poison in its skin to bring down several adult humans. Although you don't have to worry about them so much because that's only dangerous if you ingest them. So don't eat or lick a newt and you should be okay. There's a third species inhabiting the Santa Cruz mountains, which is called the red-bellied newt. And it's thought that this population was introduced from the uh, main part of its range further north in California. All three are quite toxic and they're, one of their only known predators are some of the garter snakes that we're gonna be looking at later. And Megan was kind enough to introduce us to the issue at Lexington Reservoir. And I'll just add that it is one of the largest 
uh, amphibian mass mortality events in the entire world right here in the Bay Area, where literally thousands of newts each year uh, succumb to road traffic. So that is definitely one of the big issues for migrating amphibians. There are other amphibian species that must move to aquatic habitats to reproduce during this time of the year. Among them are the Western toad and the Syrian tree frog, also known as the Pacific chorus frog. Um, these guys are fairly common in the Bay Area. If you've ever heard frogs calling at night, it's most likely the Sierra and tree frog. Been their relatives have been called the Hollywood frog before because they, their calls have been used in so many different movies over time. We also have the California red-legged frog, which is another threatened species, and the foothill yellow-legged frog, which was recently listed as endangered. These guys are vulnerable to amphibian diseases, as we've talked about, as well as habitat destruction, as well as being displaced by the invasive American bullfrog. So, along with the amphibian breeding activity, you get to start seeing some amphibian eggs in aquatic habitats. So if you look into a pond or a wetland or some streams that have uh, still pools, you might see some amphibian eggs. Some amphibians lay their eggs singly, like the California tiger salamander, whereas others will lay egg masses, like the California newt, California red-legged frog, and Sierra and tree frog, just as a few examples. Egg masses can take many different shapes and sizes, such as the long strings of eggs that are laid by uh, Western toads. Um, so you can often identify what amphibians are inhabiting an area by looking at what the eggs look like in a pond or wetland. Now there are exceptions to this aquatic egg laying habitat or habit. <laughs> and these are the plepidontid salamanders or lungless salamanders that we have in the Bay Area, such as this arboreal salamander, which lay their eggs in on dry land actually, but in moist crevices and hideaways. And they often actually brood their eggs like this one is doing. So this brings us to the group that I sometimes call the pop-up salamanders because they kind of can be found whenever the ground is wet. Do you turn over a log? Um, among these are the arboreal salamander. These guys do quite well in urban habitats as well as in natural ones, which is pretty cool. That we can sometimes find them in our yards. And they have very strong bites. <laughs> you can maybe tell from this one's large jaw muscles that they can inflict quite a bite. It's just a, a small wound for a person, but they've even been recorded to uh, kill snakes that have attempted to predate them, which is pretty impressive for a little salamander. Another member of this group is the yellow-eyed Encetina. You'll notice that this salamander superficially resembles some of those poisonous newts we were talking about earlier. It's, no, it's what's called a Batesian mimic, or a pretty much harmless animal that looks like a toxic animal, which helps it to avoid predation in some cases. We also have the California slender salamander, these guys are ubiquitous in the Bay Area and are, are sometimes found in great numbers. This worm-like appearance of the salamander is no coincidence, as these guys are fossorial, spending the vast majority of their time underground, often living in the burrows of invertebrates. There are two species of slender salamanders in the Bay Area, with the Gabalin Mountains slender salamander, pictured on the bottom of this image, uh, creeping up into the southern part of the Santa Cruz Mountains. They're very difficult to tell apart just by looking at them, uh, often relying on just small proportional differences. There are some more specialized salamander species as well in terms of where they live. Among these are the California giant salamanders, which are one of the largest terrestrial salamander species in the whole world, with adults reaching lengths of about a foot long. These guys are also one of the only known predators of the banana slug, which is pretty cool. This is the Santa Cruz black salamander, and something special about this guy is that these are only found in the Santa Cruz mountains. It's the only place that they're known to exist. And they are another streamside species, spending most of their time in riparian zones. They're a uh, really cool species, changing from these little green juveniles like the image in the bottom right, and developing into a pitch black salamander like above. And they were just this year uh, listed as endangered by the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. 
as we get into late winter, we start to see some reptile action. You might see things like alligator lizards starting to scurry around in the underbrush, as well as small fossorial snakes, such as shark-tailed snakes, popping up undercover objects, and sometimes out in the open. These guys eat things like slugs. Another small fossorial snake species you might encounter is the ringnecked snake. These guys are fairly cold tolerant and tend to be more active when there's still some moisture. As we head into spring, reptile activity really takes off. But the amphibians aren't quite out for the count yet. If you keep looking into those pools of water, you might see amphibian larvae, like this tree frog tadpole or these toad tadpoles, as well as salamander larvae, those species which do have the aquatic stage. This is a California tiger salamander larva. Some adult amphibians will stick around aquatic habitats, such as Pacific newts. They tend to hang out in pools as long as they're available. And then you will also find things like garter snakes, which are hunting those amphibians in these habitats. Reptiles start to use cover objects for thermal regulation, warming up in the morning, in the evening sometimes, helping them to digest meals. Um, so snakes and lizards will use cover objects like rocks, logs, and pieces of uh, man-made debris like this piece of plywood here. Lifting this up, you might find a snake. Um, always be sure to be careful where you stick your fingers. Be mindful of how you lift cover objects. This is also a good time to point out that these animals are often pretty reliant on the microhabitats that form underneath these objects. The specific uh, parameters of humidity and temperature are pretty crucial for their active season. And if they are carelessly handled, then these objects might become unusable for the animals. So you should always place the cover object back. If it's something heavy like a rock, make sure to move the animal out of the way before you place the object back so you don't squish it. Um, and then you just, you just want to make sure that the cover object goes right back in its original footprint. The harder it is to tell that you ever lifted the object, the better. Another method of thermoregulation is basking. So you will often see reptiles like this fence lizard on the left basking in the sun, or snakes sometimes poking parts of their bodies out of uh, hideaways to soak up some solar radiation. Some of our sun-loving lizards are in the family Phrynosomatidae. That's a cool word. <laughs> Among these are the ubiquitous western fence lizards, which do great in urban habitats. So these are the blue belly lizards you see in your yards and at city parks and things like that. But they also inhabit all of the natural areas in the Bay Area as well. We also have horned lizards in the Bay Area, primarily in open, arid, or drier areas. Um, but they have declined quite steadily over the past few decades, um, partially due to habitat destruction and because the invasive Argentine ant has forced out the native ant species that this lizard depends on. There are also populations of the side blotch lizard in parts of the Bay Area. These guys are famous for their rock, paper, scissors mating strategy. Which sounds pretty funny, but it's a really cool biological uh, concept and uh, we don't have time to cover it today, but you should definitely Google the rock, paper, scissors mating strategy. If you've seen these lizards with blue tails, that is the Western skink. They have blue, bright blue tails as juveniles, and as they become adults, it usually fades away. But in the breeding season for these guys, they often develop a nice bright orange and red coloration on their faces. There's a second species of skink, which lives in parts of the East Bay, called the Gilbert skink. And this species has a pink tail as a juvenile, and then that also fades away in adulthood. These guys drop their tails quite readily when they're feeling threatened, so you should always be gentle if you decide to handle them for some reason. These guys are often confused with skinks, but they are indeed in a different family of lizards. These are the alligator lizards. We have two species in the Bay Area, the southern alligator lizard and the northern alligator lizard. And although they look quite similar, there are some pretty interesting differences in their biology. The southern alligator lizard is an egg layer, while the northern alligator lizard gives live birth. It's just a cool factoid about those guys. <laughs> there are a couple other different lizards in the Bay Area. So in some of the hotter, drier areas, you might see 
Oh, he's this guy. This is a California whiptail. These are extremely fast lizards, and you might identify them just based on their behavior because they almost never stop moving. They kind of dart from bush to bush in a spastic manner, and they're pretty hard to get close to. <laughs> this strange looking animal is not a snake, but actually it's called the northern legless lizard. These guys live in loose sandy soils in parts of the coastal areas in the Bay Area and sometimes in uh, mountainous regions, but they can be difficult to locate um, and they are very fossorial spending almost all of their time under the substrate. They're not a snake and some of those features that you can tell them apart with is that they have eyelids and they blink and they uh, their tail starts about midway down their body and you can tell that by the little vent that they have. Uh, I don't have a picture of that, unfortunately. But yeah, they're half body and half tail, whereas a snake is almost all body with the tail at the end. Going into our snakes, it's important to note that rattlesnakes are the only potentially dangerous species in the Bay Area. We have one species of rattlesnake here. It's called the Western or Pacific rattlesnake. And um, they certainly do not want to bite you. So uh, their first line of defense is their excellent camouflage. And if that doesn't work, they'll either try to flee or they'll warn you with their rattle and their last resort is to bite. So as long as you are paying attention to your surroundings carefully um, and give these animals some distance and respect, they should never be a problem for you because you do not want to waste their precious venom that they use to capture prey on defending themselves. Another cool aspect about this species is that they feature parental care. They have pretty intricate social lives that we're just beginning to uh, uncover. So females, pregnant females will gather in communal nesting areas and they give birth to live young and they actually will watch over each other's offspring for a couple weeks until they're ready to go disperse into the environment. Hey, There's Brent. some snakes. Jumping yeah. in here just to ask a question. So we got okay. some questions in the chat about just venomous, 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 sorry, snakes <laughs> in general. Um, so you're saying rattlesnakes are the only dangerously venomous ones. So if we come across a snake in the wild, generally, if it's not a rattlesnake, we'll be okay to pick it up. Or like, what are some guidelines that you can share about that? Yeah, so all the other snakes are technically safe for you to pick up. That doesn't mean that you always should. Um, there are some species in the Bay Area that are protected, which we'll cover a little bit later, um, which you should never handle. Um, and then other species, they might bite you, but it just feels like little pinpricks or a little pinch, and it's uh, really not a serious thing. But um, you should only pick up the snakes if you have a good reason to. Yes, good point. Well, I just wanted to remind everybody that just because we can doesn't mean we should. Um, but I know there's a lot of questions about uh, what kind of danger is out there. So good to know. Thanks, Brandon. Back to you. Okay. There are a few snake species in the Bay Area that are sometimes confused for rattlesnakes. Among these are the Pacific gopher snake. These are one of the most common snake species in the area. And they have quite a similar pattern to a rattlesnake, and they will even mimic rattlesnakes as a defensive mechanism. They can flatten out their heads to have that same triangular shape as a rattlesnake. They'll shake their tail very quickly in vegetation, uh, somewhat simulating the sound of rattlesnakes rattle. And their hiss is even particularly raspy, which some people believe sounds like a rattlesnake's rattle. But they are um, completely harmless and you should never worry about these guys. Another one is the California night snake, which has a similar pattern to a rattlesnake as well. And they have elliptical pupils like a rattlesnake. However, this is another harmless species, and they're quite secretive, so you're pretty unlikely to find one in the Bay Area. The feature that you can always go to is the tail. These species will have a long tapering tail with a sharp end, whereas a rattlesnake usually has a rattle unless it falls off, but they will still have a blunt tail if that happens. And baby rattlesnakes are born without a functional rattle, but they still have a little button at the end of their tail, and so they never have that long tapering sharp tail. But the bottom line is that if you don't know 100% what a snake is, you should assume that it could potentially harm you. So be cautious. This is the California king snake, and they're quite well known for their capability of 
uh, predating on rattlesnakes. They are resistant to the venom and these powerful constrictors easily overpower rattlesnakes. But there's a misconception that this is all they eat. In fact, king snakes are dietary generalists and they will eat pretty much any type of animal that they can overpower. That includes other types of snakes as well as lizards and birds, mammals, things like that. So they eat pretty much everything. There's another species of king snake in the Bay Area called the California Mountain King Snake. This is a snake sometimes confused for the venomous coral snake, but there are no, no coral snakes in, in California. So whenever you see a snake with this red, black, and white color pattern, it is harmless. You don't need to worry about it. They are quite secretive, and um, I would recommend if you want to see one just hiking around in their range. So lots of places in the Santa Cruz Mountains have these snakes, and if you spend a lot of time out there, you might just stumble across one. Going into the many flavors of garter snakes that live in the Bay Area, we have two subspecies of what's called the common garter snake. Although ironically, these are the two species, uh, the two garter snakes in the Bay Area, which are the least common. One of them you have already met today, the San Francisco garter snake, which is an endangered subspecies with a very small range being almost entirely restricted to uh, San Mateo County. So. They have a very limited range, which makes them vulnerable to habitat destruction and disease, but some of their populations are still doing quite well. And so hopefully those will remain stable into the future. We also have the California red-sided garter snake, which looks pretty similar, but the stripes aren't confluent except for the one on the top. And so um, these guys are also one of the predators of those toxic newts that I was talking about earlier. They have resistance to those poisons that almost no other animal does. This is the coast garter snake, which sometimes looks like this and sometimes looks like this. For <laughs> that reason, they're often confused for the other garter snakes in the Bay Area. Um, people mix them up with San Francisco or red-sided garter snakes when they have red coloration. And when they don't have red coloration, they're often confused for the other garter snakes, the aquatic garter snakes in the Bay Area. We have two species of the aquatic garter snake, the Santa Cruz subspecies and the Diablo range subspecies. They look quite similar and they do pretty similar things, spending most of their time in and around water as their common name implies. And this is another one of the species of garter snakes that are resistant to the toxic newts. This is the yellow-bellied racer. They're a very quick moving species and they're likely to escape you before you've even realized you've gotten close to one. Um, but if you are lucky to get up close, you'll see their beautiful coloration and their big eyes, which indicates their uh, excellent vision. And these guys are actual um, active pursuit predators, which sometimes chase down their prey items instead of waiting uh, in ambush like some other species of snakes. The California Stripe Racer is similarly very quick, active in the daytime, and can chase down its prey. Um, they're sometimes called the Chaparral Whip Snake, which tells you something about where you're likely to find them in Chaparral habitat or in other brushy habitats. They're excellent climbers as well. We have an endangered subspecies of the snake called the Alameda whip snake as well. Some people might be surprised to know that we have boas in California that are native, but they are not the same eight foot behemoths uh, native to Central and South, uh, and South America. They are known as the Northern rubber boa. This strange little snake is also sometimes called the two headed snake because they have a very blunt tail which they use as a decoy head when they're being attacked by a potential predator or a uh, parent rodent that's defending its nest against the snake. And for this reason, the adults of this species, like the one on the right, are often covered in scars. And when you look at a skeleton of a rubber boa, you'll see that the tail is actually ossified or reinforced with bone, which further protects its spinal cord. As we go into summer, uh, herp activity tends to die down quite a bit. They don't use cover objects so much because it gets too hot, too dry for them to be very effective. And uh, it becomes a little bit more difficult to locate a lot of these animals. 
if you stick near aquatic habitats, you'll still see some stuff happening. You might see our only native turtle to the Bay Area. This is the Southwestern pond turtle. Um, however, you're just as likely to see the invasive red eared slider, which has displaced them in many areas. Don't release your pets, okay? You may also see amphibians metamorphosing like this little tree frog is doing. They'll develop their, wing, their limbs and soon be able to move out of the water. And you'll still be able to see some aquatic snakes that are hunting those animals. This is also a time of year where you might see some of the rarer species of snakes for the Bay Area. These uh, snake species like the glossy snake and the long-nosed snake, the San Joaquin coach whip, and the western black-headed snake are generally more associated with Southern California and its deserts, but they do creep up into the arid zones of the East Bay. As we go into fall, there is still not all that much activity happening. But one exciting thing about the fall is this is the season where we start to see baby snakes. And so I've included my hand in all of these pictures for a size scale reference. So it's also a time for you to consider what you can do for herb conservation. We've talked about some of the threats that these animals are facing and uh, generally donating your time in the form of volunteering or your money <laughs> can help some of these local land management and acquisition organizations like Semper Virens Fund, uh, Post is among them as well. You can volunteer for organizations like the Stanford Conservation Program, um, do some habitat management, and you can uh, get involved with the, Cal the University of California Natural Reserve System. And then being a responsible outdoors person and making sure to disinfect your gear and make sure that your outdoorsy friends do the same is very important. And being mindful of the places that you go, be careful when you're driving on those back roads to not run over animals and um, to be mindful of their habitats as well. If you want to learn more about the amphibians and reptiles of the Bay Area. There are some good field guides like this classic Peterson's guide by Robert Stevens. Some of the names might be out of date, but there's lots of excellent information in there. In California, we're lucky enough to have our own online field guide, which is called California Herbs, run by Gary Nafis. And every species that lives in California is covered here um, with range maps and habitat descriptions, natural history, uh, information and everything you need to go find these animals. For the ins and outs of the activity of herping, there is something called the Field Herping Guide, which came out just a couple of years ago, which is a great place to start if you're completely new to this topic. And so with that, I'll take questions. Wow, Brandon. Um, everyone in the chat, can we just give some applause, some accolades for Brandon for just showing us all of these amazing creatures? First of all, Brandon, like I'm just amazed at the breadth and diversity of all of these different animals that you've been able to capture and identify. And it's just really cool to see up close. Um, can you provide maybe a rough estimate of how many species roughly there are in the Bay Area to discover of like both reptiles and amphibians? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it kind of depends on where you draw your lines for what's included in the Bay Area, but generally you're gonna get answers ranging from 40 to 50 something uh, species of amphibians and reptiles collectively. Okay, yeah, that's like pretty sizable. Um, folks, while um, we have reached our Q&A part of the presentation, so now's the time to type in the chat your questions. Um, feel free to retype them if, we, if you typed it in earlier. It'll just help us kind of um, elevate the questions that you want to be answered. So while we're waiting for those questions to come in, I have some questions from the pre-submission process that folks submitted. So. Um, we know that you mentioned, I, it looks like from your presentation that spring is pretty much a really active time for a lot of animal, um, reptiles and amphibians. Is there specifically a time of day when they're most active? So uh, reptiles in particular tend to track temperature more than time of day. So if you're looking for snakes, uh, a lot of people have the misconception that they're only active on those hottest days, but that's not actually what it, snakes and lizards like 
they kind of like the same temperatures that we do. Um, they like mild conditions, like in the mid 60s to mid 70s, it's kind of a hot spot for the Bay Area. Mm, okay, yeah. So generally when the sun is out, um, you'll see more of these um, animals out. So let's, I'll <laughs> oh, go ahead. Oh yeah, in the springtime and the winter, the, the sun is good, but actually for snakes, you often want some cloud cover. Oh, okay, yeah. good to know. Um, we also have a question from the pre-submitted process. People are generally interested in how they could um, provide better habitat for reptiles and amphibians in their home um, mm -hmm. garden or backyard. They notice a lot of them kind of just roll through. Is there something that they should know as homeowners to make it a little bit more friendly? Um, there was questions about pesticide use, all that kind of stuff. What would you say about that? Yeah, so pesticides are definitely not good for these animals, especially for amphibians since they have very sensitive skin. Um, so definitely try to avoid using pesticides in your yard if you're hoping to attract herbs to your yard. Um, and then just having desirable habitat features with some uh, thermal con complexity. So like kind of rock piles and that sort of thing. Um, reptiles and amphibians really utilize that sort of stuff. Um, water features are often helpful if you live in a drier area. And that'll encourage things like frogs to stick around longer. Mm. That sounds good. Brandon, we're getting a little bit of audio feedback from your end. Um, oh. So if you want to just fix that a little bit. But what I heard was generally the use of pesticides is not good because um, it's going to get on their skin, which is really bad for them. But we want more <laughs> features that allow them to thermoregulate a little bit better, which is like rock cover as well as water features. Um, great. Thank you. Let us go to the live chat questions. Um, Let's see here. Let's get into specifics. Some people are really interested in knowing. Uh, Will asked, how can you ID a rough skin versus a California newt? Okay, yeah, so what you'll often hear is that you should look under the eye because typically a rough skin newt will have dark coloration underneath the eye going down to the lip. And then in the California newt, they usually have their light orange coloration coming up to their eye. However, in the Bay Area in particular, there's a, a bit of overlap in that feature. So what I usually would say is to look at them directly from above and look at the margins of their head. If the eyes are inset from the margins of their head, so like say this is the newt head, if the eyes like in here, then um, it's a rough skinned newt. If the eyes bulge out from the head margins, then it's a California newt. That's a bit more of a reliable trait to look at. Awesome. Uh, speaking of newts, we have questions um, about what is the best time of year to go herping for amphibians like newts, and where we have a lot of questions asking where is the best places to go herping. What would you say? Yeah, so for newts in particular, they're going to be, uh, well, you want to go in the winter usually or in the spring if the ground is still wet or if it's recently rained because they like to move when it's wet outside. Um, in terms of places to go, uh, you should just be looking for habitats, really. Uh, it's always good to read up on the species that you're interested in, in particular, and read about what type of habitat they're found in and learn to recognize that habitat. It's a little bit of a touchy subject with amphibians and reptiles because there are still a lot of uh, bad characters out there who might collect where they're not supposed to, or uh, there's still poachers out there, or people who might really wreck uh, sensitive habitat or not follow their biosecurity measures. So um, it's important to kind of keep uh, locations vague in some cases. So if you're uploading herbs on iNaturalist, always obscure those observations and obscure every observation that you make that day to protect uh, the locations. Yeah, I totally hear you and, and really appreciate you naming that. And folks, if you're listening, let's treat these animals with care and respect and observe what we can. Um, and so, yeah, we're intentionally being vague on purpose, but if, if you listened about where the best conditions are to find these, you might be able to be lucky to find them on your trail. Um, this is an interesting question. Do you consider it unethical to go out herping with the intention of handling them? And is there a way to do it more ethically? So, um it's definitely an enjoyable experience to to handle the animals sometimes, um, and we have to keep in mind that this is uh, a very 
<laughs> involved experience for the animal as well. And so uh, I always say that you should keep the handling to a minimum. So don't walk around with the snake for an hour and release it somewhere else. Um, you know, it's usually a pretty low stress experience for an animal to be handled briefly for a couple pictures and then let go. Um, there's, there have been studies on short-term handling and uh, they go back to uh, baseline stress levels pretty quickly. So it's not that big a deal. Um, for amphibians in particular, it's good to either wear gloves or make sure that your hands uh, don't have any chemicals on them. And it's good to kind of wipe your hands in the dirt or dunk them in the water. Um, and that will help uh, reduce the impact that your oils and your hands uh, have on the amphibians. But definitely don't handle them if you've recently used uh, hand sanitizer or sunscreen or anything like that. Mm, good to know that, yeah, these are wild creatures, very sensitive creatures. Yeah. And if we feel so cold to handle them, do it with care and minimally yeah. as well. I'll also add that um, in places like state parks, you can get in trouble for handling any type of wildlife. So if you want a safer area to, in terms of getting in trouble to handle them, uh, I would recommend things like county parks where fishing is allowed um, and having a fishing license is required. Mm, good to know. They're kind of treated the same way as fish in, in that way. Good to know. Yeah, officially, we're not recommending you pick up any animals that you are unaware of. But if you're going to do it, please ex exercise a lot of caution and look up the rules and regulations. Gina asks, um, in the spring, I saw some tiny snakes that I determined from the internet must be sharp-tailed snakes. They're just the size of worms, and it's the first time I saw them. Are they common here? Yeah, so they're quite common in parts of the Diablo range and in parts of the Santa Clara Valley where there's still intact habitat, as well as some parts of the eastern Santa Cruz Mountains. Um, they're definitely one of the more common species, especially when it's still wet outside. Okay, very cool. Um, Penny asks, is it true that the number of rattles on a rattlesnake's tail shows how old the snake is? Kind of like tree rings, is that true? <laughs> Not quite, because uh, they add a new rattle segment each time that the snake sheds its skin. And the frequency at which they shed their skin can be determined by things like how much they get to eat in a given year, as well as uh, how healthy their skin is. And uh, also the rattle segments can sometimes break off. So that's not a good indicator of their exact age. However, you can sometimes tell the relative age of a rattlesnake because if the rattle comes to a taper at the end, you've seen, you see that that snake has been growing in the recent past. Whereas you, if you find a rattlesnake that has rattle segments that are all the same size pretty much, and it's a big snake, you can tell that that snake has been big for quite a while. And it's probably been an adult for a long time already. Thanks, Brandon. Well, let's do some myth busting. That's an interesting question. <laughs> Christopher asked, is it true that a Western fence lizards have an immune system that will clear a tick of a lion? Yes, uh, Western fence lizards do have enzymes in their blood that neutralizes Lyme disease and can even clear the tick of Lyme. Wow, that is very cool superpower to have. Yeah. <laughs> um, there's some interesting questions about alligator lizards and some folks are curious, like if they, we saw some questions submitted, is it, uh, I guess like, okay to keep wild animals as pets, such as, you know, an alligator lizard? Um, I would recommend first considering uh, getting captive bred animals that are already in the pet trade readily, um, because it's just an easier thing. They're definitely not going to have parasites or anything like that, um, or at least not as likely as if you get a wild animal. Um, if you are just dead set on keeping a native species, make sure it's something that's fairly common so that you're not disrupting any populations. Um, make sure that it's something that's not protected and make sure that you have a fishing license so you can legally collect it from an area that you're allowed to. Hmm. And uh, make sure to read up on all of their captive requirements before deciding to do so. Thank you, Brandon. Um, speaking of alligator lizards again, do they mate in winter and do they retain their sperm? I'm not sure what, yeah, what, do, what would you say? Um, yeah, mating activity definitely can start in the winter when they're becoming active. Um, I don't know about the retention of sperm specifically in alligator lizards, but it is quite common 
in reptiles in general. So I would not be surprised at all if that's the case. Mm -hmm. um, some Ranger Marcus asked, tell us about the ranges of the black salamander species in California. Uh, this is the species that you studied, correct? Yeah, so I studied the Santa Cruz black salamander, which um, was formerly a subspecies of the speckled black salamander. And so there's something called the black salamander species complex, where they all used to be called Aneides flavipuntatus. And most of their range is in Northern California. Um, and just a handful of years ago, they were split up into full species by my undergraduate advisor um, based on genetic work. And so now there are four different species of black, cal uh, black salamanders in California. And the Santa Cruz black salamander is only found in the small Santa Cruz mountains in the South Bay. Thank you. We have a lot of people who really care about the snakes and salamanders. And so AV asks, how do we help slender salamanders that it's in a swimming pool? Like, do we rescue it? What does a rescue attempt kind of look like? Yeah, so slender salamanders definitely aren't known for their swimming capabilities. They're definitely a terrestrial species, so you should get them out of the swimming pool for sure. Um, I would recommend giving them a rinse with some fresh water that doesn't have any chemical treatments in it before you go ahead and release it in a nice uh, sheltered and hopefully damp area where they can live out their life, hopefully. Thank you. Um, why do Western fence lizards fall asleep when you rub their bellies? What causes that? <laughs> yeah, so um, I don't know the specifics of this mechanism, but um, a lot of animals, when you flip them over um, and they don't have any anchor point to right themselves, they will resort to kind of uh, playing dead to an extent. I don't know if that's exactly what happens for West, uh, Western fence lizards uh, in particular, but that is... Uh, a possibility. Yeah. Okay, we have time for a few more questions. So let's keep it going. You're doing great. Thank you so much, Brandon, by the way. Of just course. Answering all these great questions. Um, Andrea asks, who are the most endangered species and where? Maybe let's highlight a few and talk about what the threats and uh, where they're located. Yeah, this can be a somewhat complicated question because we have some that are just subspecies. And so like the San Francisco garter snake and the Alameda whip snake, which have very small ranges, but they are part of a larger species. So um, you might say that those are particularly endangered, but there's more than one way to look at that for subspecies. Um, in terms of full species, uh, the ones in the range uh, in the Bay Area would be like the Santa Cruz black salamander, which only lives in the Santa Cruz mountains. Um, another really endangered subspecies, of course, is the Santa Cruz long-toed salamander, which I said only lives in a handful of ponds south of Santa Cruz. So that's one that could potentially uh, blip out. Um, yeah, I'd say those are the ones that are most up there. All right. I have a question for you. Uh, what is your favorite reptile and amphibian? <laughs> Let's do one of each. Um, okay. Yeah, I'm, I might have to give you two for reptiles because I'm partial to my study species at the moment, which is the Western rattlesnake, just because they have so many interesting facets of their biology and natural history. Um, but in terms of finding them, uh, I'd, have, I'd have to give a nod to uh, the mountain king snake, which is just a thrill to see those colors in the wild. Um, and then for amphibians, I'd say the Santa Cruz black salamander for sure. That's amazing. Um, and is there one that you have yet to see that you really want to see? Um, in terms of species in the Bay Area, I have not seen a black headed snake up there. Um, they're definitely more common down in Southern California. Uh, but yeah, I just haven't gotten lucky and crossed paths with one in the Bay Area yet. Well, I hope maybe soon you'll you'll have the luck to, to be able to see one in person. And um, thank you so much again. We are reaching near the end of the hour and I just wanna give a huge thanks to the chat for providing all this wonderful dialogue and questions to Brandon. And uh, I just wanna recap some of the lessons that I learned with you, Brandon, and then make sure you help fact check them for me, make sure I got it right. <laughs> um, but I learned that birds are closely more related to reptiles and amphibians based on the animal tree, is that correct? Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yes. And 
with some certain species like newts, um, they're okay to touch, but not okay to lick, right? So that means like handling and then eating using our hands, correct? Yeah, yeah. Um, generally, they're not just constantly leaking a bunch of their toxins out. So um, you're probably okay to eat after, but it's always a good idea to, to wash your hands. Okay, yeah. There's a lot of people in the chat that was like, it really could be as about that. So I just wanted to make sure we touched that. that again. <laughs> um, I learned something new about, I, I've heard danger noodles before to describe snakes, but the chat introduced me to a term called danger gummy to describe newts and salamanders, so I thought that was pretty funny. <laughs> um, I learned that the California giant salamander eats banana slugs. Are they the only natural predators that eat the slugs? Um, that's the only one I know of that regularly eats banana slugs. I'm sure other animals sample them at times, but they're a very unpleasant thing to uh, try to devour, so. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, we learned that these reptiles and amphibians are really sensitive to humidity. So if we are going to flip over cover objects, we need to be sure to place them right back where we found them. So that it looks like we didn't even touch it at all because of these really sensitive microclimates. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Don't just toss the rock back over. You want to carefully set it back into its footprint. And if there's any big gaps that weren't there before, you want to kind of push the, the substrate against it so that you're sealing it back up a bit. Excellent. Um, I, I really like what you said earlier about how to describe at a glance if it was like a snake or a skink. You mentioned a snake is like a whole body and a little tail. What were the other ones that you mentioned? <laughs> so yeah, the legless lizard, which looks like a snake because it doesn't have any legs. Um, it's pretty much half body and half tail. So if you were to flip the animal over and look on, on its underside, they have what's called a vent which is the opening to their cloaca, which is where they uh, poop and pee from and uh, where they have, uh, where they reproduce. Um, so that's located about halfway up the body of a legless lizard. Although they can very easily break their tails. So um, sometimes that ratio is a little off. Great. And then lastly, um, the only venomous snake that we have in California is the rattlesnake and this beautiful creature, the king snake, uh, is not to be mistaken by a coral snake because they don't exist in California. Um, do you have a mnemonic device that you can share with us on how to remember that, just in case when we're <laughs> in other states? So first of all, uh, the rattlesnake is the only dangerously venomous snake in California. Uh, harmless snakes like garter snakes are actually venomous, but they have a much weaker venom and it is mostly used for subduing things like amphibians. So it's typically not dangerous to people in the same way that uh, you could consider a bee sting. So there's a potential for a reaction, but it's very unlikely to hurt you. Okay, um, and what should we do if you know a reaction was to occur if you get bit by a snake? What does the crisis response look like? So um, a typical bad reaction to a mildly venomous snake, like a garter snake, would involve probably some swelling of the local area, headaches, sometimes diarrhea. Uh, and so if you're experiencing those symptoms after a snake bite, you should visit the hospital and uh, see if you can get some care for that. Or if anything happens to worsen, then you are in good hands. <laughs> Good advice. Uh, and then in terms of mnemonic devices, many per people have heard that uh, old rhyme of, you know, red and black, friend of Jack, red and yellow, kill a fellow. Um, while that holds true in parts of the United States, it does uh, not hold true um, in other countries, like in parts of Central and South America. There are many different types of coral snakes, and some of them uh, have red touching black. And so that rhyme will not work for you if you travel. <laughs> <laughs> well, good to know, but we're almost out of time here. And I just want to say thank you again so much. Um, chat, please give so much love to Brandon. Brandon, before we let you go, is there anything else you want us to know? Um, well, I just hope that everyone can enjoy these animals respectfully and uh, we'll start to explore this part of the Bay Area's unique biodiversity. And then uh, I see that you have put my Instagram down there. Um, I used to upload videos to YouTube a bit too. I haven't done that in quite a while, but maybe I'll pick it back up at some point. 
Yeah, and all these photos, <laughs> you took all these photos that you're showing us, right? Um, the vast majority of them, yes. You'll notice that some were better than others, and that's because I didn't start really using a real camera until I moved to San Luis Obispo. <laughs> um, so the good pictures are from when I visit the Bay Area now, and then I have my old cell phone pictures and stuff. And then some pictures were other people's, but yeah. Yeah, well, if you visit Brandon's Instagram page, you'll see all these beautiful pictures and more. Um, once again, thank you so much, Brandon, for being here. Let's smile for a brief picture so we can screenshot that soon. <laughs> thanks for having me. Great, well, thanks for coming, and we'll see you next time, Brandon. Wait, wait folks, don't go anywhere. Um, if you like tonight's event, we host plenty of events and the next event that's coming up is Raptor Fest. And so we know that reptiles and birds are closely related. This is the event is related. So you can come if you're curious about birds, um, join us on Saturday, November 4th for Raptor Fest. This is a unique opportunity to see and learn about birds of prey and the importance of conservation in our communities. And this presentation will include a master falconer who will share about the history of falconry as well as the biology and habits of raptors. And will include a flight demonstration of birds flying over your head, as well as um, many booths from our community partners. And it's all free. So sign up today, scan that code or visit the chat link um, below. And if you're new to post and want to get involved or check out many of our event upcoming events, such as walks, hikes, uh, you can visit our website at openspacetrust.org slash events. We host so many different events and they're all free. So come hang out with us and learn more about the work that we do. And last but not least, please let us know what you thought about the event. Uh, suggest new topics. How did we do so that we can ensure that we bring you quality content every single time? All right, that's all for me. Thanks so much again. My name is Megan Nguyen. It's been a pleasure to being your host tonight. And thank you, Brandon, again, for joining us. I'm so sorry if we weren't able to go to all your questions. I appreciate every single one that participated and the awesome chat, keeping the community vibes going. Um, otherwise, good night and fill out that survey. Thanks, everybody. We'll have a survey.